What's up, everybody? It's Soren Baker here on Unique Access Entertainment. As always, please, please, please hit that subscribe button right there. As y'all know, that's free. That enables us to keep coming to you guys as often as possible with as many interviews as possible, with as many icons as possible. So please hit that subscribe button, like our content, share it, talk about it, be about it, each one, teach one. And we appreciate you guys' support. Now today, man, we have the honor and the privilege of being joined by Sugar Bear from EU. Thank you for coming through, sir. No problem. What's happening? Thanks for having me. Oh, it's, it's an honor, man, uh, being from Maryland and, and listening to basically since I started listening to music. It's a pleasure to get to speak to you. And um, I was excited because with the uh, the verses, when they played uh, It's Your Thing, uh, <laughs> oh yeah, a lot of people uh, posted about that, commented about it. And uh, in the midst of verses for you guys to get shine. What was the significance of that for you? That was a blessing in the sky, man, to show you that even though that was originally done by the Osley Brothers, It's Your Thing, and EU and Salt and Pepper, we made Shake Your Thing. So that was a like a, a blessing and a, a great feeling that came over me, man. It was like, it was large. It was really large. I was so grateful. Because they didn't have to do that, but they did it. Yeah. And uh, I think it was uh, it was great for you guys to get some extra acknowledgement for a lot of your contributions. Right. And I wanted to, since you guys have done a lot, I wanted to take it way back to the to like the '77 era, the early records with the "Free Yourself" and "Experience Unlimited." So, um, on that record in particular, uh, it's "Experience Unlimited," and later it became at least on record EU, even though everybody knew you as Experience Unlimited. Right. So wh why did you guys write it out on the on the first album like that? Because that was our intro. That was that was our intro to the world, Experience Unlimited. And, uh, you know, as, as time went on, over 10 years after that, you know, we still was Experience Unlimited. But a lot of people <laughs> had a problem saying Experience Unlimited. So uh, a guy named Sam Martin said, he had us playing at the show in uh, White Oak, Maryland, and he just put E-U. And this is real, this is real talk. And there it was. But everybody knew what E-U was, you know what I mean? So <laughs> it was a blessing. And we, from there, we've been going on E-U. But when I do interviews, I tell people what E-U means, but they don't know what it means. I say Experience Unlimited, which came from the name of Jimi Hendrix Experience, because there's no limit to our experience, because we could play a variety of styles of music as young, young, young guys, you know, so. Yeah, and that's one of the things that people go back and listen to that album, especially the Free Yourself song in particular, but. Yeah, I wrote that, Free Yourself, yeah. Well, that's why it has extra significance for the interview today, that song, but I think the whole album, they could really see the instrumentation, which uh, with EU and with Chuck Brown and the Soul Searchers in particular, right. you guys, I would argue had much more of that um, and had a lot more funk roots, especially early on than a lot of what people later knew or understand to be as go-go. So, I agree with that. I agree with that. Yes. So I think we was a little more funky than all of them. <laughs> no disrespect to nobody, but you know. Well, the Free Yourself song in particular has a lot of the horns and the grooves and, and the breaks and all that. Yeah. So given that go-go hadn't really been named or coined or all that at, at, in this 77 era. What, what was it about you guys that made you have those longer records and that made you ex extend the breaks and all that stuff on your own? Our audience, you know, our audience, when we perform, you know, live, of course, everybody was doing their thing, dancing, whatever, et cetera. And so that'll make us play longer. So that's where it all evolved from that. You know what I mean? So, we hit it and you can see the people like, don't stop, don't stop. So we keep going. And that was like, you know, that was a thing in the metropolitan area in DC. People wanted to continue to power without stopping, going again, stopping, going again. No, you keep it going. And that's where the go-go birth started coming in. Right. And we knew how to do that easily. Cause we had, and you had to have a strong drummer, period. <laughs> the drummer, cause he didn't want to keep it going. Right. So for you as a as a musician and as an artist, what drew you to funk in particular? 
instead of maybe R&B or soul or ballads or whatever? What was it about funk? Well, in my, when I grew up, you know, we was out there with the hippies, you know, uh, Jimi Hendrix, Led Zeppelin, Black Sabbath, Carlos Santana, you know, Mother's Finest, Mandrill, Earth, Wind and Fire, you know, all these groups. So, you know, I had a, I came up with the rock era, so I was like in it. I love rock music, so to still to this day. So, like I said earlier, in uh, Jimi Hendrix's experience, that's where we got experience limited from. So I always been, that's where it came from. Gotcha. And then with the Experience Unlimited album, what was Black Fire Records? Who owned that? What was it? That was, uh, uh, I forget his name, man. It's right on my tongue. But anyway, that's, that's, they was out of DC. And they were the ones who um, had an interest in us because they saw the potential and, and some, such a young band. But we could play. And we played our own music, which is rare. And, uh, you know, we all grew up on Top 40, but we could really play top 40 as well as we play our, as our own song. So that's when Jimmy Gray, that's his name. Jimmy Gray had an interest in signing us to his label, Black Fire Records. You know, remember we was all still in high school. We was young, had no clue or nothing about no records or nothing, you know? So he signed us and that was the Free Yourself album. That's where it came from. Right. And then on that, on the song Free Yourself, since you co-wrote that or wrote that, what was it, in particular that made that special to you to where that really stood out and made the album? Because I, I, I was feeling the problem at Funkadelic at that time, you know, and the breakdowns and Carlos Santana solos. And I just, in my mind, I just went there. And I said, man, I, I, we can do this. And I just put it all together. You know, I had an intro, you know, then I put the, put the foundation in the melody and then went from there. Okay. And then the, Next actual record that I knew was just the way you like it. Um, from you just the way you like it. Yes. So yeah. with that, um, that was a move to Inner City Records, at least the version that I had. What? Um, so what? Why did you guys switch? And what was going on with the band um, in that? Because that was a few years later. Yeah, that was a few years later. And remember, GoGo uh, -Go music was so becoming so dominant in our area, and. Uh, so you had to convert, and that's when the transition was coming. You could tell from free yourself to that. You see the difference? Oh yeah. <laughs> so that you just asked my, you just asked your own question. That's where it came from. That's exactly what happened. You oh. know, and that's why we say just the way you like it. Because remember, we always want to please our audience. That was the key. That was the key right there. So we just wanted to please our audience and went on. Well, that's a it's a amazing you say that because I've been to. So many shows, uh, way more rap shows than go-go shows now. But at, at this point, I've seen so many shows and the artists seemingly don't care if the, a lot of times if the audience is into it or if they're caring about it. But that's always been the, one of the main, if not the main things it's seen with go-go. So why, why do you think other artists have a disconnect from what you've seen? You've toured you know, so many places around the world now. What's the difference from what you've seen with EU and GoGo -Go in general versus how everybody else performs? Well, for, for EU, you know, we always been about pleasing the crowd. And thank God that we had records that people knew. <laughs> that helped a lot. But you can also, a lot of artists, you know, play their own music, which is beautiful. But I believe in entertainment, you got to learn how to please many people as possible. You're not going to please everybody, but at least give them some familiarity with the sound that you're producing or the show you're producing, don't play for yourself. You're playing for them too because they're the ones paying the money to come see you. So I always kept that in my head. I said, we got to, even if we go, say like we go over Japan, we have to find out, they knew what EU who was, but I still wanted to get them, let them know that we could play one of their songs as well. And they were could identify with it, you know, so that brings the crowd more festive and makes your show more easier. Right. And even in the even in the 80s and definitely moving into the 90s with GoGo, -Go, the thing I was always curious because you guys uh, had so much original music as well as the covers, but a right. lot of the artists 
a lot of other groups or bands didn't, right. or at least not as often as you do, I would argue. So what, why was it so important for you guys to make original music compared to doing, focusing more on the covers? Because, you know, to me, my, my personal opinion is that you always got to be ready because you never know. Because people, first thing they say when anybody want to sign you, that's what made Jimmy Gray sign us. Because he heard original, original music, not a bunch of cover tunes. You follow me? And that was back then. So as, as the industry got bigger and bigger, they was looking for new acts. You always got to be ready because you never know who's listening to you. So that was a plus for us because we had lots of EU originals. So it made it easy transition. Yeah. The old la la, of course, on just the way you like it. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> what was it in the beginning when you were like, how, how do you spell relief? Was that just from the commercials or what was that? Exactly. Like? That was how you spell relief. And we just edited that into the song and. Ooh la la la. That's how I that's how I spell it. <laughs> okay. And and that it made sense. Uh-huh. And then that and going with your bad self, uh, again on the co-writing, what did you notice for you as a performer, as an artist, as a writer, that you got out of writing songs as opposed to just some of the other songs, either if they were instrumental or different things? What was different for you about? Well, if the difference for me was the people responded to what I said. And then I said, go ahead with your bad self. And that's like a confident, you know, build up, you know, uh, good God, with your bad self. You know, so you, you're going on. And I got that from James Brown, that part right there. And then, I, then we put in our own feelings around it. So, you know, you learn coming up, you know, from all, every artist and then you, you should. And then you can see if they got something you can use, you take a little bit of this and that. Mix it all together, then next thing you know, you got a hit. Yes, you do. And wind it on up too with the, the future funk coming soon thereafter. What in this uh 81 82 era, I was still a very, very young man at the time, but I would hear songs or hear different things. But how many shows at this point were you guys doing a week? Would you say? Uh, I say around averaging around five, four or five locally, mainly locally, right. You know, locally, I mean, the DMV area, so yeah. Okay. But we go up in New York occasionally, and we go down North Carolina occasionally, and, and Philadelphia. Those were our East Coast thing. It was the East Coast thing. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then how did the Chris Blackwell connection come up with the movie, with Paint Up the White House Black, with two places at the same time? How did you guys in particular get so in with Island Records and Chris Blackwell? Well, that was, that was uh, from my understanding, because, uh, you know, like, again, I never get into that much the business side of it, but Max Kidd was the one who knew Chris Blackwell, and he wanted to do something on Google -Go Music. <clears throat> Unfortunately, <laughs> it was terrible, and I, I'll be the first to say it. And number two, a lot of the live crowd scenes they had in Good To Go, the movie, that was EU's performance, but they edited us out because I want I didn't want to be a part of it. Once I saw, saw where the story was going, with drugs and all that, I said, no, that's not what we're about. No, no, I'm not gonna sell myself to the devil. No, so they, they kept our crowd scenes and, and, and edited in the movie, and I was glad that we got out of it. That's all I'm gonna say about it. Well, uh, one thing I did know from talking to Chuck Brown a few times over the years was the, uh, the disappointment of the film and the universal kind of stiff arm to it from the go. Oh my movie. goodness, yeah. yeah. But uh, the thing that's also interesting to me about it is that to, I wanted you to explain how artistically, because it, a lot of times we hear these stories of artists selling out and all this, but the go-go artists were like, nah, every one of them, it seemed like said, no, nah, we're not part of this. So what, where do you think that that was so different compared to other places or other artists that they're so willing to be like, Hey man, if that's what it takes to get on, we're going to do it. Well, my, from my opinion, I believe that you should, you should tell your own story, whoever you are or whatever you do. When you got people from the outside, Remember, Chris Blackwell was from England, New York, somewhere. 
he came in and want to produce a movie on go-go music in Washington, D.C. First thing you got to do is, is know what go-go music is and what it's all about. You know, you can't go on with, with your uh, theories or it's drug-related or it's, it's a bunch of crime, it's this and that. No, that's not. We have party music. That's what we're all about. The beat goes on. They could have did something with that instead of good to go. What are we going to? But when I saw the drugs, you know what I mean? When I saw the drug scenes and all that, I'm like, hold up, man. We can't be a part of this. This is, is and this will be going nationally. This movement will be distributed nationally. It's going to kill us before we get started. Right. So that was my opinion. But, I mean, you guys were on Island, Junkyard was on Def Jam. A lot of the other groups had major deals. Um, what made you guys then still go with Island in particular? Well, we only went the soundtrack. That's what that was. We didn't get on it. I mean, like I said, Chris Blackwell and, and Max Kidd at the time, he was helping us trying to move our go-go music period. He was with Chuck Brown. He had Trouble Punk, Rares and the Boys, EU, you know, man, and Rare Essence. He was trying to push like the Motown sound, he's pushing the go-go sound. Right. And, and Chris Blackwell was the only one that had a, a real good interest in it. So you had to jump on a, on his bandwagon right there because clearly you saw the potential. Yeah. But it's all in marketing, you know. We didn't have the right people behind us at the right time. Okay. And then what was the TTED records? That was, again, that was uh, local people trying to push our music. Okay. Ted Hopkins, uh, uh, Rio Edwards, and a couple more guys. Yeah, they, they wanted to help broaden how our horizon, you know. And uh, unfortunately, I mean, I'm, I'm glad they did try. They did try, because nothing was a failure but a try. So, okay. You couldn't lose. We was in a, we was in a no win situation. So, you had to go, go with all your guns. Whatever works, let's go. Let's try it. Be sure to check out the History of Gangster Rap by Soren Baker. He's official. History of Gangster Rap features exclusive interviews with Ice T, Snoop Dogg, MC Ren, the DOC, and dozens of others. The History of Gangster Rap, a definitive look at how Los Angeles changed rap forever. In Los Angeles, the streets definitely set the tone of the hip hop music. A 19, I got a $50,000 car. My whole angle always was I'll be street, but I will always tell you the horrors that go along with this life. It would be penalties and casualties for just wearing the wrong color in somebody's neighborhood. And once gangster rap made it from the streets to the TV, the genre exploded. What's that, five on your TV basketball? Your MTV is just catapulted us from being local heroes to national gangbang rappers. The history of gangster rap discusses it all from 1980 up till today. It's always gonna be shit happening in the streets. You know what I mean? So it's always going to be something to talk about. The history of gangster rap in stores now.